presentation. Thanks, Abby. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Sarah Borwell. I'm originally from Middlesbrough, played at Tennis World, and then, like Abby, was lucky enough to find my way on the American University pathway route. So, for me, it was life changing and um, just a really good way for me to develop my tennis, gain confidence, and then I ended up going pro. But like anything, with so many people wanting to, to do it, there's some very strict rules. And so not mm -hmm. only the tennis aspect of everything is important, but because you're a student athlete, the NCAA and the NAIA, which are the two governing bodies, are very particular with the type of academic timeline that you have, mm -hmm. and also the GPA. So if you're doing GCSEs, are you doing Nat 5s if you're up in Scotland? Those grades are very, very important because they're going to either generate academic money or they're going to get you through the door. So eligibility wise, you have to have a certain GPA or certain grades and you must follow the correct academic timeline to make sure that you're admissible. Okay. Does that all make sense, Abby? It does. It sure <laughs> does. I'm sure there's a lot of changes that you're going to talk through, so it'll be interesting. Yeah, and I won't ask you what your grades were, and I won't tell you what mine were, <laughs> but with the new uh, grading system now, obviously in our day it was all A, B, C, maybe yeah. a few more Cs for me. Uh, now we know that it's numbers. So if you're, if you're a good student or working hard, getting... Mm -hmm grades which are fives or higher are ideal if you throw in a, f a few fours then it's not the end of the world but ideally if you can work towards getting five sixes if you can throw in sevens that's really going to help you generate some good academic money and and the big thing with that is just working hard and kind of making sure that you do all the right classes and you get all the right mm -hmm. grades the, so the, the big thing with the GPA and not only for the academic side, but with the tennis aspect of it. So basically when a coach comes to you when they're starting to recruit you and they want to see, OK, can this player make my team? How do they look? They're also going to look at your grades. And all of these factors are really important for you as a student athlete with building your profile and being seen by the the college coaches. I guess that's even just the first thing that you probably, as a tennis player growing up, you don't even realize. You're like, you're so focused on the tennis side that actually having a good GPA gets you in front of as many good coaches and good colleges. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, it, and it's especially true for the boys side. So if mm. we if we think about the girls first, if you mm. have an eight UTR or higher, you're generally being offered a full scholarship where everything's paid for. So you don't mm. have to break down the, the athletic and academic scholarships. If you're below an eight UTR or you're a boy where there's not always full scholarships to be had, mm -hmm. the, the coach is going to get very excited by someone who is good at tennis, has bags yeah. of potential, but also is a very good student. Mm -hmm. So if I have someone who maybe the UTR is a little bit lower, but academically they are fantastic, a mm -hmm. coach knows that, okay, I might not be able to give them much ath athletic scholarship money because they're playing mm -hmm. low this year. Mm -hmm. I know what their budget is and I can get them within their budget because they are so good in their GCCs or their Nat 5s. So... All of those, all of those days where you just think, oh, I don't want to go to school, I hate mm. maths, I don't want to study, it mm. actually will open more doors for you tennis-wise, and, and that's just going to change the whole outlook of who you hear from, how much it mm. costs, so studying is really important. Mm -hmm. All right, Ready? next slide, I think, now. Ready. Okay, so... We've heard GPA, so that's the grade point average, and they're going to use the GCSE grades and they're going to use the NAT 5s. Now, for NCAA Division 1, in order for you to be eligible, you want to have a 2.3 GPA, which means, ideally, again, you're throwing in 5s and not many 4s coming into that. 
and and privately afterwards if you have your GCSEs and you want to contact me and say, hey, what's my GPA? How have I done? Am I doing the right subjects? I'll always be happy mm -hmm. to just make sure you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. So Division 1 entry is a 2.3 GPA. NCAA Division 2 is a little bit lower at 2.2. So if we're kind of borderline of getting that calculation right and we think, mm -hmm. oh, we might not actually hit that 2.3, that a division two university is what we're going to be looking at so that you have eligibility. Mm -hmm. Division three, fantastic setup in both tennis and academics, but they've only just started working with the NCA with the clearinghouse bit, so the eligibility center. So the GPA isn't as important, but it is when you first go through the doors for admissions. So each university will have a set criteria of what kind of grades they want. And mm -hmm. of course, the higher the grades, the more academic money they can give you at each university. So eligibility, eligibility issues at Division 3 aren't often an issue, but mm -hmm. getting that academic money is. So again, grades, study hard for them. Mm -hmm. NAIA is the other governing body. It's set up in exactly the same way as the NCAA. Clearing house for the eligibility is a little bit, well, not as strict. You can sometimes mm -hmm. find a few more kind of loopholes to get in. But mm -hmm. the GPA for the NAIA is a 2.3, where if you send in all of your, con uh, your transcripts and they calculate a 2.3, you don't have mm -hmm. to do anything else. Okay. If you're below a 2.3, then they will also require an SAT or an ACT. So ACT, the score is 18, SAT, 970. Okay. Both, both doable. Okay. And you have to take, you have to take the ACT or SAT for the NCA one, division one, two or three. Is that right? Good, good question. So with COVID, everything became test optional in both the NCAA and at universities apart from there was a few states like this whole state of florida mm. even through covid when it was impossible to sit exams they still wanted the sat or act which okay. obviously made it very difficult yeah a lot of universities are still test, test optional but a lot are still bringing it back and the sat or act generates a lot of academic money so it's always a very important job for you to do Mm -hmm. But it's not as important as it was because it doesn't impact your eligibility. So when you register for the NCAA now, they won't. Well, currently they still ask for the SAT, but you don't have to send it in. Okay. So it really, it's really the GCSE grades and the NAT fives, which are the kind of most important factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think there was always like a feeling that if you took the SAT, like you were okay even what whatever you did on your GCSEs. And it's interesting that there's such a shift now that you really do have to focus to continue your schooling throughout. Yeah. 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 It was a it was a nice sliding scale before yeah. where you were a really good student in GCSEs and the SAT mm. could be really low. Yeah. Or if you were if you didn't do well in GCSEs, your SAT had to be higher. So yeah. it's nice that that worry I, I remember the day when i had to i got 980 on the mm -hmm. sat which is probably below average and i had mm -hmm. to get above a thousand in order to yep. get admitted to my university yeah and i remember when i literally had one chance left to do it and I, I made it but it, it wasn't mm. a very pleasant experience so it's nice that that's actually been removed now yeah um the final option and this is if Let's say you have no interest in going to university at all. So at 17, 18, you have no real interest. You're not really paid too much attention to the GCSEs or schooling. Tennis is just everything. Mm -hmm. There is another pathway that, okay, you might not be admissible for NCAA or NAIA, but you can go to junior college. And the ways to get you into junior college and then out the door to an NCAA or NAIA school. Mm -hmm. But the big thing to remember for junior college is as soon as you turn 19, you cannot really accept any prize money. They, they say $350. 
if it's higher than that, then junior college is totally wiped out as an option. So just always keep in mind that as soon as you hit 19, mm -hmm. you can still go to junior college and then transfer out, but it's the prize money aspect that becomes really important. Mm -hmm. And with that, if you've had a gap in education at that point, going up into the junior college, once you start at that junior college, will NCA accept that even if there's been gaps before? Good, that is a good question. So this is what is tricky with junior college. Yeah. It's because you will still, so let's say you go straight into junior college after A-levels and there's no yeah. gap. You then can do, if, if you're, if your grades are good, but you're using junior college as a platform to build mm. uh, your profile, to be seen by coaches, to yeah. improve your UTR, then you can leave after a year. And okay. you have to go through the eligibility center for both the NCAA and NAIA. Yeah. So they will then okay. look to see, okay, did this student athlete come right out of school? If, okay. if there is a gap and you've used up a year, then the NCA especially will say, okay, there was a gap here, that's your gap year, so that will impact eligibility. Okay. So even though you go to junior college, it doesn't reset everything because you still have to go through the clearing houses later on. It just, it does give you that ability just to kind of get in through the back door if you have, yeah. if you have made some decisions which perhaps aren't great. Okay. Good question. A lot of people, even junior yeah. colleges, that the don't know. Yeah, it's tricky. About. Yeah, because I think as well, even as a parent, if you're not aware of those gaps and that sort of impact that it can have later on, and you think, oh, I'll take the kids out for a year or et cetera, et cetera, then it really does have an impact later on that perhaps yeah. maybe not everyone's familiar with. Yeah. Um, so even that junior college is a good option, definitely. But yeah, all of those decisions, such an impact later on. Yes, exactly. So GPA, academic timeline, understanding the eligibility for each division, mm -hmm. really important aspects to uh, keep in mind. Perfect. Okay, so this is, this is probably one of the most important slides that anyone will ever see. And, it's, and it just makes sure that when you go through the eligibility aspect and when you're being recruited by college coaches, there's no hiccups or hurdles or anxiety because the placement process is stressful anyway. To then add in, oh, I've not done the right courses, it's just, yeah. you just don't need that in life, really. So yeah. when you're in year nine of school, you have three years to complete a minimum of five GCCs or five NAP fives if you're in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And they, they have to be, they used to call them core subjects, but now they're just calling them separate subjects. So they have to be in maths, English, science, a social science, and one more from that group. So most of us do combined or dual science. That's two, that's two grades. You could do another English, English literature, English language, any uh, social science. So you've got to have five. A social science is what we call a humanity. So a history, a geography, a psychology, a sociology, a modern studies. Um, so they're the five kind of core subjects that you must make sure that you've done. The NCAA will ask for year nine reports and year 10 reports and GCSE certificates. And right now they're trying to use the year nine and year 10 reports to kind of tick off those core subjects, which it doesn't generally happen. Mm. And they'll have to go on the old model of eligibility, which is fine. But if, if they can process you sooner, then excellent. So when you're at school, make sure that you have your year nine, year 10 reports, and then you maintain those GCC certificates because you're going to have to send them into the NCAA. And it's a lot easier and, now with sending in. You don't have to mail them anymore. It can be emailed, which makes it a lot quicker. And your reports, are they like the report cards? Like yeah, the it's, yeah. yeah, it's just, and that's what we've kind of explained to you. So they're not exam based. They're just the end of year report cards. It doesn't matter if, 
I don't know, Tom is a naughty student and has bad grades. The NCA don't care. They just mm -hmm. want to see what subjects you did and when you were in year nine. So don't panic if in year nine you just were having a bad year and the report yeah. card's not good. No one cares. It's just mm -hmm. when were you in year nine? Did you yeah. do your GCSEs on time? Have you done mm -hmm. all the subjects? Okay. Um, as soon as you've done the GCSEs, back in the day, but you can still do them online, you can actually choose to do two AS levels online, and that will extend your grad date a year from GCSEs. Or if you're in Scotland, you can do hires. So you do two hires in one year, and this will extend through. If for some reason you've missed any core subjects in those GCSEs, you mm -hmm. can pick them up in the AS levels. So if you've not chosen to do a geography or history, mm -hmm. you can you can do a psychology in AS level and that will count as the core subject. Not many people do AS levels anymore because it's just something that again changed in schools. But if mm -hmm. you do, make sure you sit the exams. It's really important that although you will be cleared by the NCA before that, because you'll fill out the amateurism forms, you've got to make sure you sit the exam and your grad date will move a year. Yeah. Um, if you do the normal schooling pathway and you're doing two A-levels, you have two years to do them. If you're in Scotland, you must do two advanced hires. So you can't do more hires. It has to be the two advanced. Um, I'm big on options and I think the British University pathway is amazing for both academics and for tennis. And you know, it's close to home, you know what you're getting. Doing three A-levels maintains that option. So mm -hmm. if I only need two, mm -hmm. but doing three maintains more options. You're mm -hmm. not putting all your eggs in one basket. And if you do want to go to one of the very elite universities in America, like a Stanford, a UCLA, a Duke, they will require three A-levels. Okay. Um, but for eligibility purposes, it's just two. Okay. Now, the final part is the BTEC and this there's there's a lot of different BTEX and it always used to kind of trip us up because we'd all often take the wrong one. There's mm. the BTEC level three, which is 120 credits, and that's for one year. And then there's also, if you want to extend for two years, the extended level three BTEC. Now, things change a lot in the UK and there are loads of different ways for us to do it. Some people choose for the UCAS points to get one A level with a BTEC, two A levels with a BTEC. It, it did cause a lot of confusion before with the NCAA, but mm -hmm. now they have added a lot of different BTECs to the rule book. And okay. it, we'd be on here for another presentation if I listed them all. Yeah. But I know that you're going to send through the actual rule guide. Yeah. Which shows all the different BTECs that you can do. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more choice now and there's a lot more ways to kind of mix and match, which is nice. Okay. And with all of the changes, do the NCAA or the Clearinghouse stay on top of that? Like from when we went from grade A, B, C to, to the numbers, I'm assuming everyone is updated and familiar with all of those? Yes, it can sometimes take a while and there's a lot of, especially with us we can lobby for different things and because okay. the grades the grade changes is a lot different like c's in our day c's were kind of seen as b's if that makes sense right. but now yeah. four grade which would be an old c is actually seen as le not like lesser like it's not as yeah. strong a grade so okay. they it can move slowly but the nice thing with these btex now with so many of them added it, this mm -hmm. is what was tripping us all up before because every mm -hmm. school is different and we all yeah. recommend different paths but mm -hmm. that the academic guideline that the NCA have lists all of them and it lists all the course subjects so that would be a great thing for everyone to see as well okay and how about homeschooling are they taking that into is there, is there any difference with the pro like the programs that you can go through I know I did my a a levels homeschooled um which caused a whole headache but 
I'm sure now that they recognize programs or how does it work? Yeah, it's well, in, so in America, homeschooling means that we set the whole curriculum. So if I chose to keep my kids at home, mm. which I can generally survive a weekend, so I yeah. wouldn't be able to do. But if I did, homeschooling is where I set it myself. For us, it's online learning. So mm -hmm. when you come to do the eligibility center, you'll always say it's online. And right. yeah, as long as you follow these guidelines and you're doing the GCC, you do five GCCs online, you do two yep. A-levels online, it's either your tutor or the exam board or the Oxford Home Learning or whoever's setting yep. it, fill out the future forms that you're going to need. Okay. But there's okay. no issue now. It's just, it just takes a bit more time because sometimes it's hard to find your tutor or mm -hmm. these, these, companies don't always want to fill out the forms as easily as your school teacher would it yeah definitely and what happens if you want say you didn't get the grades you wanted and you want to reset certain exams does that because I know it's such a timeline and it's so tight on getting all the paperwork in clearing house you've got coaches calling you all the time pressuring you to make decisions etc um what happens if you have to retake subjects good another good question so the GCSEs are the most important grades because that's what's okay. going to that's what gets us through the eligibility is what uh, gives us the academic aid so if you if you have a score if you're 11 you've taken all your GCSEs mm -hmm. a few that you're just not happy with you can reset yep. them but you mm -hmm. reset them alongside starting your A levels or the B tech so you've got to do okay. them alongside it and then you can improve the score and we use the better grade okay. for A-levels. And I want all the, if there's student athletes on, I want you to close your ears. <laughs> the A-level grades aren't important okay. because you have to think now my August 2023 players, they've all mm -hmm. committed, some of them committed in October to a university right. based on their SAT or their <laughs> GCSE. So as long as you're sitting those three or two A-levels, you're going to be on campus in America when those grades come out. Right. And now, okay. before it used to be a big headache for you and I, because mm -hmm. if we failed those A-levels, we then would lose our eligibility. And I think yeah. the NCA took into account that it's two years of work. They're very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. You have an off day on one exam. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. So now you just have to make sure you you try and you take them and then you'll be fine. OK. And another question, when you're filling out your paperwork, you don't have to declare a major, correct? Yeah, you don't have to. And that's what's okay. nice about America. British universities are generally a three year mm -hmm. course and you've got to know immediately going in what you want to yeah. do. Here, the first year is just core subjects. So. I went in thinking I want to do exercise science and be a physio. I yeah. took bio 101 and mm. realized I'm yeah. not good enough for this. So yeah. I quickly okay. changed to marketing. Um, okay. so you can change, well, you can change as late as like a year and a half in. You just have mm -hmm. to make credits work. So yeah, you can, you can have no idea what you want to do. You yep. pick up a load of different intro classes. You might stumble across psychology and think mm -hmm. this is for me. And then you start the degree later on. Okay. Perfect. Well, should we go for questions? See if anyone has any questions. I think so. Sounds good to me. If anyone is wants to pop in some questions. Yeah. Do you have to do a humanity or can it be a language? That's a good question. So, um, them. So there's, we, we need five, and so that extra, the plus one, could be a mm -hmm. foreign language, but okay. we have to have a humanity. So if, you, if you've if you done your GCSEs and you haven't taken your, your humanity, we can mm -hmm. find it in the A-levels, or we can get credit from year nine and, and year ten. So they'll give, like, half credits if it's done back then. So... I can always, ch if you're, I don't want anyone panicking. So if everyone was like, I didn't do humanity, I've chose my A-levels, mm -hmm. then contact me and we'll go through it and we'll make sure that everything's fine. So there's always ways to change things. That's why we're starting now, which is nice.
Definitely. Okay, another question. Uh, what are the BTEC points and are they similar to UCAS? Um, no, completely different to UCAS. So let's say you're mm -hmm. taking the extended level three BTEC, that's going to extend your grad date two years and and they're just going to look, they'll have your school fill out a form saying that you've taken the BTEC, this is the one that you're taking, and then you're going to be cleared. But the, you just have to make sure that you're taking the right BTEC. There's a lot now to choose from. So mm. we'll send out the the rules and you can see which BTECs are required. But the, it's a very different system to UCAS. Okay. Yes. And I will make sure that everybody um, follows up. Well, I'll follow up with everybody with that um, academic information booklet. Um, another question, if you're going for Duke or Stanford, do they require A-level grades given they require three A-levels? They're going to um, admit you based on your predicted grades. So ideally, if you're looking at those, it's mm -hmm. A's. Um, Duke might need, Duke and Stanford might need four A-levels as well. I have Arthur mm -hmm. Ferry there. Um, He's doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. He did three, but the, okay. those type of universities will look at your predicted grades and you will be admitted based on them. Mm -hmm. They will then probably require the A-level certificates being sent through. Um, okay. I've not known of anyone, once you get to Stanford, really tanking on your A-levels. So everyone's kind of got the grades yeah. that they've predicted, but yeah. So yeah, so it's three A levels, maybe four for Duke. Mm -hmm. They'll get your predicted grades to admit you to the university. And will the coach? I'm assuming the coach, when they get in contact, they will know all of the academic requirements, whether it's three or four, or or kind of help you along that way, rather uh, than anybody else. Or will it be an academic advisor from the university, or who? who yeah, can help so with that? you. The coach will work through with their academic liaison who will go directly okay. to admissions because a coach oftentimes can't speak directly to admissions, especially okay. at schools like this. So they'll have someone who talks to them. But it, for those type of schools, it's three, sometimes four A-levels. So okay. Three for sure, maybe four if they're really kind of being particular. Okay. And do you know if RE still, whether it counts as a humanity at GCSE it, or not? Yeah, it, it doesn't unless it's the religious studies plus philosophy um, okay. course subject. So right now, RE does not count as a humanity unless it's got the philosophy and ethics bit tagged on, which tends not to be what we do in GCSEs. Okay. And then I know this is probably going into a a different thing in terms of scholarships but if you don't get a full scholarship are there examples of costs that would be books and academic costs right yeah so so that should be our next presentation really with yeah. how to kind of break costs down but generally yeah. for girls if you're in the eights it's a full scholarship and then when mm -hmm. you're below it becomes a partial scholarship so the same for the the boys where the and the men's team might have 10 players on it but there's only yep. four and a half athletic scholarships. Okay. So the coach has to be very clever with his money where who he yep. gives the athletic money to. Um, yep. So if you're playing number six on the team, you won't get much athletic. If you're playing one, mm -hmm. I have guys who are 11.8 UTR who were offered full scholarships because they were playing high and yep. they were very, very good students. And you can okay. you get your academic scholarship, your athletic scholarship, and you put it together. And then okay. you pay the difference, but that would be another great presentation. We'll it, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. We discuss exactly how it's broken down, what it covers, how you can improve it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then on, uh, just another question about starting the application process and timing wise. I know we, we did a presentation on that a little bit about um, kind of what to expect, but yes, yeah, starting the application process. Um. Ideally, you start when you're ready. Yeah. So it's really important to know 100%, I want to go to America, while looking at the British University pathway, you do both pathways at the same time. Mm -hmm. Knowing that if you aren't going to get a full scholarship, that mm -hmm. it's affordable. Generally, $15,000 mm -hmm. is a good amount for everyone to think about if okay. your UTR is not what we need. Yeah. Uh, and then... 
once those you think, yep, I want to go after it financially, mm -hmm. we can afford it. Usually you start as soon as your GCSEs are over and it gives you a good okay. two years to build your profile for the coaches, to really schedule the right tournaments, mm -hmm. to make sure that when you start talking to coaches, you've got all of the SAT out of the way, you've got all your applications ready, and then you're good to go. And then it just gives you a really mm -hmm. good, it gives you two summers to really kind yeah. of implement a good plan of moving that UTR up. Definitely. But I think these are conversations, as you say, you can start earlier in terms of having the kids understand the importance of exams at their GCSE level. More yeah. Than and then as soon as the GCSE exams are done, mm. that's when you start the process. But I've had a player who, who literally just came to me now for August. And she was like, okay, okay I, now I, I really want to go now. And yeah, we've got literally a two week window probably to get everything done. And it's not going to be fun because there's so many applications, but it's, it's doable, but just Very for stressful. A, yeah, it's as soon like yeah. 2025 are probably already beginning. Okay. Basically. That's, that's what you've got to think about.